A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us from up here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you the name the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom will I show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today, today is Psalm 99. We'll read it in unison. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. O mighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the Church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Five years, been a lawyer 50 years. 
Um, so it's a, a pleasure to be here and kind of interpret the gospel, the words of the scriptures today, sort of from my experience, uh, being on the ground in a different way. And I am interested today, I think, in the readings. Usually the readings, readings kind of fit together today. They don't seem they fit together. Sometimes we're in a quandary about why the church even picks the three readings it does because they don't always seem to jive. And sometimes the person doing the sermon is really kind of doing acrobatic, right, to uh, kind of tie all these together somehow. But I think today there is a there is sort of a, a tie together that I want to talk about you know, you know, in the context, I think, of particularly of the, or I guess in terms of the gospel. So we know today in the first reading uh, that we continue to track in Exodus the history of freedom, freedom from slavery, the movement of the people from Egypt, the formation of the people of God. This is about the formation of God's community. And we see today, of course, the, through the lens of Moses, who is a hero, but certainly somebody that has uh, human foibles. And just like we all do, sitting here, standing here, have our human foibles. And it's important, I think, to look at Exodus is a story about us too, informing and living in community. But what struck me about the reading today is that, uh, is how Moses prays. So there are three parts to Moses' prayer today that are kind of interesting. And the technique, I think, is really interesting because this is presented as prayer in conversation with God, right? Conversation with God. I never let a sermon go by without calling, suggesting that we spend more time in the morning doing prayer in a conversation with God. I call it coffee with God. You may not drink coffee, so you can substitute whenever you want. But in the first moments of that morning when it's quiet and peaceful, they have this conversation with God as Moses is doing. Not to sit there and read prayers, but they have a conversation, or just be silent, you know, for 15 or 20 minutes, or what we call centering prayer. So, I'm going to come back to these three parts of the prayer of uh, Moses. The second reading, Paul, writing to the people of Thessalonica, praising that community for sticking together for staying united. So we don't know exactly what happened in Thessalonica, but the Christians were persecuted. It may be that a couple were, or some were martyred. We don't quite know, but we do know that because of persecution, the regular stuff happened, loss of employment, uh, discrimination, all of that that goes on when we persecute people, right? We have all kinds of levels of persecution that we humans can employ. My favorite reading today, though, is uh, the gospel. And when I was a kid, I love this gospel because it's a gotcha gospel, right? Jesus got him. You know, they try to trap him and fool him, right? Well, you know, that's a kid's way of looking at it. And I think we make a mistake when we look at it as a gotcha. Because Jesus isn't out there just performing, doing tricks, catching people in traps, and all of that. He's actually there, think about this. He, he, is actually, he knows what he's doing. He is training, teaching people, walking with him. This isn't a story that Matthew relates because man, this will be a good story for them later on. This is a story that he's telling, Matthew's telling us, that Jesus was part of as a way of teaching us. And what is Jesus teaching us? So you have this coin, right? 
the hated Roman Empire, the brutal, oppressive Roman Empire, this coin that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are going to use, want to use to trap Jesus to take away his cred, to undermine the fact that people are following him and not listening to them. And so what does Jesus say? The first thing he says, uh, show me a coin, and where is the coin? Where is this hated coin? It's in their pockets. Hypocrites, he says. You hypocrites. You can pause a moment and consider how many times we are hypocritical when we criticize people. But the point, I think, that Jesus is making in this discussion about render unto the government what belongs to the government and unto God what belongs to God is that Jesus is saying, I think, very clearly here that we have a responsibility to live in a civil society. That's fine. But that civil society has got to comport to the will of God. We don't have a split society, right? We can go out and do what we want here and then come to church on a Sunday, get absolution, and it's all cool. I think that's what Jesus is saying. That's not cool, right? So if that's the issue, then how do we go through that discernment? It's very easy to live a bifurcated life, but how do we go through that discernment that pulls us into making sure that our civil society, that our government comports will, with the will of God. This is where I think we go back to the prayer of Moses. The first two parts of the prayer of Moses are, Lord God, we want to be your people. And God says, okay, that's cool. Uh, and Lord God, I know that I need to be a leader here. Yeah, you do. And then Moses, total lack of humility says, and he's on a roll, total lack of humility says, okay, show me your glory. And what does God say? Fat chance, Moses. Right? He says, no, that's not how it works, Moses. That is not how it works. How it works is like this. You get in that position of respect. You get in that position of listening to me and not telling me what you want. And I'll show you this. I will go by you. You'll be in the cave. I will put my hand up so you can't see me. You can't see my glory until I am passed. And then I'll pull my hand away and you can see me walk away. I'm going to come back to that because I think that ties in to something uh, important. But it's very interesting, right, that you can have that in that prayer that Moses loses his humility. And God still says, well, okay, look, I know, I know who you are, but this is what I will do, right? So how do we then deal with the question of civil society, government, and our lives. So we know that there are certain things in the gospel that we must do that are clear commandments if we're followers of Jesus. And that there are some things that we're not clear about and how do we apply what Jesus talked about in our concrete situation. We know that we have to feed the poor, the hungry. We know we have to give drink to people who are thirsty. We know we have to take care of older people, that we have to take care of the widows, as it's put here. We know we have to work for peace. We know we have to visit people in jail. These are all what we have subscribed to as Christians, right? But there are other issues we don't quite know how to deal with. 
And when we deal with them, we have to start with what does, what is the will of God and how does our society jive with that? So I work at St. James. My community is an immigrant community. I have uh, people in the congregation represent seven different uh, countries um, south of the river. So what's the role of civil society with regard to immigrants? Right? What is the command of Jesus to people leaving their homes, walking across Mexico, going through the Darien Gap, dealing with the cartel, seeing bodies that are already, people that have already died, scattered around them, walking, 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 leaving their homes because they, they can't deal with the poverty and the oppression. What's our role? Our bishop has already told us that putting the barbed wire across the river is not Christian, let alone humane. What is our role, right? This is what I'm talking about, that we can't separate the coin. It's one coin, one coin. Under God, what belongs to God. So none of this is easy. None of this is easy. None of this is easy. Teresa of Avila, the great Christian mystic in Spain, has this great story. So Teresa was uh, reforming the convents in Spain. She reformed 16 convents of nuns, right? The laxity that was going on, this is right after the time of Martin Luther, who himself was fingering the laxity of the church. So Teresa of Avila, is one step ahead of the Inquisition in Spain because she's not totally very orthodox. But, the, but here's the story. So Teresa had, had to travel at night to these different convents throughout Spain. And I always pictured her, you know, you know, the silhouette of Teresa on her horse riding across the plains in Spain or in the mountains, you know, with all her religious gear blowing in the wind, you know. I love that picture. But she also traveled by cart with two burros. And you can imagine how comfortable that is. And during the night. And one night, she's out traveling, going to another convent, and her cart tips over, and she falls in this muddy river. And she is really, unhappy about this. Wet, dirty, carts flipped over, and she's complaining to God, to Jesus. Complaining, complaining, complaining. Look, I'm your friend. Why are you treating me like this? And Jesus says, yeah, well, this is how I treat all my friends. And she says, well, no wonder you don't have very many. <laughs> but that points to the heart difficulty many times of us following Jesus. Even though we say we love Jesus, we follow Jesus, do we do it the way that we should do it? So, let's come back to that third part of the prayer of Moses. Right? Moses, I'll let you see my glory after I have passed. And I think what's going on here is that the message is God will work in the community and watch for it. We see God working in the community. You know, most of us would say, yeah, Teresa, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, that's God working in the community. And we all in our lives have seen instances where we have said, yeah, that's God working in our community. I think that that's what prayer is about. Whatever leadership is, you are called to do in 
we all have different kinds of leadership. It's about building community. It's about letting the glory of God manifest itself, let God manifest God in our daily lives. How do we do that? How do we do that with respect to immigration? How do we do that? We know wages are awful for workers. And if you're an immigrant, you're not even getting paid that scant minimum wage. We tolerate that. We tolerate the expense of our, our, our taxes for military operations that we may not quite see how they comport with the will of God. And of course, we have great influence in the way that we vote. This is how we vote. This is how we live. Society needs to be in conformity with the will of God. And that's what Paul is saying in the letter to Thessalonica. Letter to you. You all have gone through, as any church has, a lot of stuff, right? A lot of stuff. But have remained united in the faith, united in supporting each other, united in helping each other. That's what Paul is admiring in Thessalonica, in the letter to the people of Thessalonica. And he's saying, he says, you know, you are reflecting Jesus, and I'm proud of you. So I think this is something I would call you to think about today, not just while you're sitting here listening to me, but maybe later on today, is how are we living in our society? What are we doing in our society to make sure that it does reflect, does comport with the will of God? Who needs our support? How can we do it? What should we do? So that's going to be the message I leave with you today. No answers, but a call to discernment. A call to strengthen our community. To strengthen your community. A call to strengthen our larger community call to make civil society more in conformity with God. And all of this, of course, is the call to love one another. Rabbi Tarfin, commenting on Mike the Six, has this to say, and this I leave with you. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justice now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Amen. Amen. <laughs>